Hello and welcome to session three of the series in support of Earth Observations for Indigenous-led land management. The presenters today are myself, Jenny Hewson, and Karen Tabor. I'm the Director of Habitat Monitoring and Climate Change Mitigation within the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. And I will now pass it over to Karen for a quick introduction. Hi, I'm also in the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science at Conservation International, and I am the Director of Early Warning Systems. Thank you, Karen. Session three will be an overview of the use of near real-time data for tracking global change. It will also include a discussion of the top five applications of early warning systems and an introduction to relevant web-based and mobile applications. So what do we mean by near real-time monitoring and alert systems? These are systems where information about ecosystem change that is detected by satellites is packaged and delivered to decision makers. The systems are based on repeated low temporal latency monitoring of fires or for forest disturbances, for example. They facilitate the tracking of global change. And importantly, they enable rapid response. This figure shows components of a near real time alert system. Fire is the detection of a threat by a satellite. This is shown in number one. The satellite sends this information to a receiving station where the data is then processed and disseminated through a variety of medium to decision makers. This is number two. And the decision maker is a critical component of the system, shown in number three, in that with this information, he or she can make an, an informed decision about whether to take action. This is number four in the figure. And so two examples of tracking global change using near real-time monitoring and alert systems. This first video from NASA shows near real-time fire detections, the red speckly dots from NASA satellites showing deforestation in action. Indeed, in doing so, they provide, first of all, alerts about immediate threats, and secondly, reveal trends of anthropogenic change. And the daily monitoring capabilities of these satellites also reveal trends in the Earth's dynamics and can indicate, for example, increasing severity of drought conditions. Such detections can even be used to predict fire season severity in advance of the fire season. These examples of time-sensitive intelligence from satellites are key to making land management decisions. However, it is only when these valuable data are made easily and readily accessible to the key stakeholders that they can, can, can truly contribute to concrete and immediate conservation outcomes, thus leading to sustainable land management. In this animation, using data produced by the University of Maryland and hosted by Global Forest Watch, we see another threat, that of annual tree cover loss, being detected but by satellites based on changes in land cover. This animation shows both tree cover loss as well as tree cover gain for the period 2001 through 2015.
The history of the development of near real-time monitoring and alert systems to support tropical forest management dates back to the early 2000s with the development of the first such system using MODIS data. Now fast forward to 2019 and there are dozens of near real-time monitoring and alert systems operating in multiple countries developed using data from multiple different satellites. This map on the right highlights some but not all systems that are available in country. And what are the top five applications of early warning systems? They include in the management of protected areas, in terms of response, monitoring and planning. Early warning systems facilitate forest surveillance. They also provide additional dimensionality to reports by supplementing with maps and graphics to add a visual reinforcer and ensure transparency. Early warning systems are also used to inform conservation policies. And finally, early warning systems are used to increase public awareness of threats and alerts. We're now going to discuss a number of near real-time systems and I will pass it over to Karen to begin this discussion. Thank you, Jenny. The first system we're going to describe is one of Conservation International's own system called Firecast. The near real time satellite monitoring and alert system, specifically designed to improve forest management in the tropics. Conservation International developed a near real time fire alert system in the early 2000s. The purpose for developing the system was to empower local stakeholders with timely monitoring information from satellites in order to prevent the destructive effects of fires on natural habitats and human well-being. Firecast now operates strategically in seven countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Madagascar, Indonesia, and Suriname. Firecast has more than a thousand users. The information in Firecast is used for diverse applications from strategizing protected area patrols for biodiversity conservation, public education, and also for protecting forest restoration sites from uncontrolled fire spread. The users range from government agencies to environmental funds to local communities. I will now highlight an application of Firecast in San Martin, Peru. Peru's Alto Maya Reserve was established in 1987 as part of the National System of Protected Areas. The reserve is located in Rioja and Moyobamba provinces that contain 182,000 hectares of human tropical forest. The reserve is biodiversity rich and is home to many endemic plant and animal species. In addition, the forests regulate water flow in the watershed and provide irrigation to neighboring communities for rice cultivation. Communities inside the reserve rely on the forest resources and the Aguaruna native communities to the Northeast benefit from its ecosystem services. The reserve is threatened by high rates of deforestation due to increased access from nearby road development, an increasing migrant population, expansion on conventional coffee farming, and illegal logging. Conservation International has a unique pilot project in the Altamayo Reserve that integrates near real-time monitoring from, from sensors in space, air, and on the ground. Threats from fires are detected by satellites in space. Acoustic sensors on the ground listen for the distinct sound waves generated from chainsaws. When the sound waves are recognized, the firecast sends an alert to park managers. 
Drones are dispatched by the rangers whenever they want to investigate a detected threat. The image on the left shows an email alert from the acoustic alert system in FireCap. The alert contains the approximate location of the detected sound, the time and the date of the detection, an audio file of recording, and a spectrogram depicting the frequencies that make up a chainsaw sound. The image on the right is of the Firecast Analytics dashboard that shows total fire counts by district and San Martin. The counts are for a four month period from January to May. In total, satellite detected, satellite detected 17 fires in Rioja and Moyobamba during these months that are typically the wettest months of the year. Using the system, there have been several successes including an event that occurred a little over a year ago. Conservation International Peru had been training a group of park rangers from Peru's National Protected Area Agency to use drones as a forest monitoring tool. At the workshop, one of the park rangers decided to use the drone to survey a property near the protected forest where members of an Alto Mayo indigenous community had reported seeing large amounts of timber being collected. The ranger had previously attempted to investigate the property on foot, but it was located on the opposite bank of the wide and aggressive Mayo River. Using the drone, the ranger captured imagery of the property and gave the imagery to the Mayo Indigenous Community's chief and the coordinator of the control and monitoring department in the Alto Mayo Protected Forest. The images showed illegal harvesting of timber inside the reserve. The drone imagery was used as evidence and reported to the Regional Environmental Authority, who then issued a citation and fined the property owner for illegal timber extraction. Next, I will turn it over to Jenny to describe some forest disturbance monitoring systems. Thank you, Karen. So now let's look at some additional web-based applications that enable users to easily access a range of data to support near real-time monitoring and alert activity needs. First of all, Global Forest Watch, or GFW. GFW is an online platform providing data and tools for monitoring forests and includes a number of near real-time monitoring options. GFW allows anyone to access information about where and how forests are changing around the world. And GFW is an, initi an initiative of the World Resources Institute, and since its launch in 2014, over 1.5 million people have visited Global Forest Watch. Using this web-based platform, users are able to explore and, and assess forest data through an interactive map interface. Users can view information according to annual tree cover loss by dominant driver, global tree cover gain, tree cover in natural forest, plantations, and non-forest, and the interactive map that I showed earlier highlighted both tree cover gain and tree cover loss for the period 20, oh, 2001 through 2015. GFW ingests a range of satellite information and using both cloud computing and artificial intelligence provides users with a range of data products and information in readily accessible formats. Global Forest Watch employs an impact-based approach through the use of information to affect action through improved transparency and accountability. There are many examples of the impacts that GFW has been able to facilitate from Uganda's National Forest Authority using data hosted by GFW to detect small-scale illegal logging on a forest reserve, 
to a government representative in the Philippines using data on mangrove loss hosted by GFW to support the National Mangrove Forest Conservation and Rehabilitation Act. Finally, Global Forest Watch aims to continually increase the range of information available and accessible through its platform and accomplishes this through partnerships with a huge range of organizations and stakeholders. One readily usable product that is available through the GFW platform are the Global Land Analysis and Discovery, or GLAD, alerts generated by the University of Maryland. The GLAD alerts represent the first Landsat-based alert system for tree cover loss. While most existing alert products use 250 meter resolution imagery, the GLAD alerts have a 30 meter resolution and thus can detect loss at a much finer scale. The alerts have been rolled out for different countries and now all countries between latitudes 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south have access to near real-time tree cover loss data. It is important to note that while the alerts are updated every week in GFW, the actual availability of new alerts for a specific region does depend on cloud cover. The GLAD methodology defines forests as an area with trees of at least five meters high and with a canopy density of greater than or equal to 60%. An alert is defined as any pixel with at least 50% forest canopy loss and alerts are based on the last clear Landsat observation. Additionally, in order to minimize false alerts, an alert remains unconfirmed until two or more out of four consecutive observations are labeled as tree cover loss. And alerts that remain unconfirmed for four consecutive observations or more than 180 days are removed from the data set. This video highlights the process used to detect alerts for an area during January through September 2014 as more Landsat data become available to complete the coverage of the area and deforestation alerts are identified through the Landsat sequence. While the GLAD alerts offer a new and very innovative approach to near real-time monitoring, it is important to understand the limitations of the data. For example, false positives account for over 13% of all alerts and most of these false positives occur on the boundaries of other changes. However, of the confirmed alerts, false positives only account for 1%, while false negatives account for 33%. This highlights that the alerts are generally very conservative and, as mentioned in a previous slide, the presence of clouds can significantly impact the results, resulting in delays of weeks or even months in detecting change. This illustration highlights GLAD alerts for a region of Indonesia for the period January the 1st, 2016 through June the the 10th, 2016. Through the Global Forest Watch platform, one can display alerts, including GLAD alerts, on the interactive map, analyze alerts for a specific user-defined area of interest, 
subscribe to a specific area of interest and receive email alerts each time a new alert is detected, and also down alert, download alerts, either as shapefiles or a C CSV file of locations, as well as accessing them through the WMS or API. GFW has also created a Forest Watcher mobile app that allows the use of alerts offline. This will be discussed a little later in the webinar. So, how can the GLAD alerts be used? Well, first of all, they're very informative in investigating unlawful activities. The alerts can help with the management of a protected area through effective monitoring, for example. They can empower local people by improving transparency, i.e. one can see where illegal activities are taking place. The alerts can facilitate the implementation of conservation compensation programs by providing one source of checks and balances. And finally, the alerts raise public awareness about what is occurring on the ground in different areas. Another useful and easy to use option for alerts is through the monitoring of the Andean Amazon project or MAP. MAP is an initiative of the Amazon Conservation Organization and provides near real-time deforestation monitoring for Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia and Ecuador. MAP makes use of data from five different satellites with multiple spatial and temporal resolutions, including Landsat, Planet, Digital Globe, Sentinel, and Perusat. And MAP's goal is to provide easily accessible deforestation monitoring information to policymakers, researchers, the media, and the public. The web interface of MAP is easy to na navigate and fully available in both English and Spanish. The interface captures the different sectors that MAP focuses on. It makes available the entire archive of alert posts that MAP has created, such as illegal logging in the Peruvian Amazon, evidence of road construction, resulting impacts from the construction of a hydroelectric dam, etc. MAP uses a range of data products, including WRI's Forest Monitoring for Action, or FORMA system, providing monthly forest loss alerts, and Terra I deforestation alerts, a near real-time system detecting land cover changes. These products derive from satellites such as MODIS with a twice-a-day collection schedule and Landsat with a 16-day collection schedule are then used by MAP for the Amazon region to assess mining, logging, palm plantation, hydroelectric dams, oil and gas development and coca cultivation. MAP includes an intuitive web portal and an image of the week to highlight a specific activity, whether it be impacts from a hydroelectric dam, etc. And as, Ma as mentioned, MAP targets policymakers, civil society, media, and the public by providing information that is easily applicable to a range of stakeholders. And as mentioned, MAP provides this information in a range of formats, including email alerts, as we can see on the right here, by posts, which are available for download as, as, as PDFs, and through its interactive map, which we can see on the left. In these examples, one can see attribution of the drivers of deforestation in different areas this email alert for a user-defined area of interest 
which highlights construction of a 40-kilometer road in Loreto, Peru, passing through a conservation priority area. And the impacts of a hydroelectric dam, the Belo Monte Dam in Brazil, that diverted up to 60% of the river's natural flow to a canal reservoir from the dammed reservoir here, resulting in the loss of fresh water to two indigenous communities downstream in the region. This loss is highlighted in these pink areas downstream, as well as this extensive flooding in other areas highlighted in magenta here. Most recently, MAP has been incorporating a new generation of satellites that can quickly detect activities such as selective logging that are not as readily detectable by other satellites. And this is an example of how MAP has used this range of satellite data to map and monitor illegal logging in the Peruvian Amazon. While the Peruvian Amazon comprises 60% of the country's area and provides countless ecosystem services to local groups, including food, water, and timber, and is a biodiversity hotspot and significant carbon sink to help mitigate climate change. The Peruvian Amazon is also subject to multiple threats. Why? Because there are countless natural resources available and illegal extraction of these resources, particularly logging, is common. And as mentioned, illegal logging is hard to detect because it is often small-scale selective logging and not large-scale clear-cutting. So given that, number one, some activities such as logging can be difficult to detect using many satellites, and given that, two, the information is needed near real time to improve transparency and accountability, as well as facilitate quick and effective decision making, MAP decided to combine forces by using a range of satellite information and a two-step process. They did this by first mapping the construction of logging roads built in the Peruvian Amazon between 2015 and 2017. A map then incorporated a second step, that of near real-time tracking, by supplementing this mapping base with GLAD alerts, Sentinel-1 radar imagery, and very high-resolution planet satellites to continue to observe new logging roads and quickly identify new logging sites. In this example, we can see a radar image, and in the radar image, we can see this detection of, of new roads, new logging roads being constructed in the area. Finally, using very high-resolution re planet imagery, we can see the range of logging roads that have been built and constructed in the area, most recently from December 2017. Using their approach, a map were able to map 2,200 2, kilometers of new logging roads between 2015 and 2017 at a rate of almost two and a half kilometers of new roads per week. The roads were concentrated in three zones, including Southern Loreto between Cordillera Azul and Sierra del Divisa National Parks, Southern Ukulele, as well as Nori, Northeast Madre de Dios. Using these types of techniques, MAP has shown the strength 
and utility of near real-time monitoring for identification of illegal extractives, allowing for increased transparency, increased accountability, and affecting the implementation of proper land management reforms. I will now pass it back to Karen to discuss a range of mobile applications. Thank you, Jenny. Next, I will review a few examples of mobile applications that could be useful for land monitoring. The first application is the World Resources Institute's Forest Watcher. This mobile application complements their global forest watch system that Jenny introduced previously. The mobile application allows users to download data on forest change in their area of interest. The collected information can be location information, photos, and even descriptive information. The app allows users to navigate to a point of interest and investigate a forest disturbance alert even when a user is offline. Forest Watcher is used by conservation NGOs, forest administrators, and rangers, control and surveillance personnel, local communities, indigenous peoples, and scientists. Here's a preview of the Forest Watcher application. The user can specify the coordinate system to record the geographic information. They can add an area of interest by uploading or drawing a polygon. Then they can subscribe to receive alerts when a forest disturbance or fire is detected within their area of interest. Here's an example of the near real-time forest disturbance alerts. You can turn on and off or here is the fire alert. You can turn it on and off for your area of interest. This sh slide shows a forest disturbance alert in the application. A user can download the information when connected online and then use the offline capabilities of the app to navigate to the disturbance. Here's another view of the application. Here, we're zoomed in to a detected forest disturbance, and this information shows the coordinates of where that disturbance is and the distance to the disturbance. Next, I'm going to introduce another mobile application that can be useful for land management. The Council of Scientific Industrial Research operates the Advanced Fire Information System. This system provides a free mobile application for fire management. The application is available in both Android and iOS. Users can set favorite locations anywhere in the world and receive near real-time information on active fires, fire danger, and also historical fire information. Here's a picture of the mobile application. This is an indicator of an active fire, including the date and the time of detection, and also the brightness of the fire. This is the, the fire risk information or fire danger. So given the temperature and relative humidity, and precipitation of any given day, there's a new indicator of fire danger, green being very low, um, this orangey yellow a bit higher. Um, if this symbol is red, that means it's very high risk of fire ignition and also um, fire spread. And this third one here is the historical fire information. So for a single point, you can see, and this information shows 
a number of fires. You can clearly see fire seasonality with the, with the number of fires for this location. The next tool I will introduce is Survey123. Survey123 helps users with customized data collection needs by providing flexibility in the design of data entry forms, capturing data, and analyzing data. The first step is to create a form. Forms can be created in a web browser or with a downloadable desktop tool for users who may have intermittent web access. Forms are customizable so users can control the information they want to collect. The second step is to capture data. This tool can capture a variety of data from geographic points, photographs, survey information, or interview data. Data can be collected in a mobile field app available for download at Google Play or the Apple Store. The application can also be downloaded to a computer desktop and is available for Windows and Mac OS. Data can also be captured in a web form that can be embedded into a website. The web form doesn't require any installation from the user, but it can provide access to online users and it can only be used to add new data, not edit or manage previous data entries. The third step is to view and analyze captured data. Survey123 has built-in reporting capabilities to examine and share your information. You can filter your data to create charts and observe trends in your data. Survey123 helps capture, analyze, and communicate your information. So our, for our final demonstration of the series, we're going to demonstrate Firecast. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to create an alert for your area of interest and also how to use the Firecast analytics to dashboard to look at historical fire trends in your area of interest. So this is the Firecast system. You don't need a user login to view the web page and to look at the live web map. As I mentioned, Firecast operates in seven countries, so through the web map you can see fire points anywhere in the world. Through this web map, you can choose different administrative districts or protected areas and view fires within those areas of interest. You can show the boundary of your area of choice. You can also change the background of the image to show contrast. And here, because right now it's really not high fire season in Peru, um, I'm going to move this bar back to get some more dates. Maybe look at um, look at May through December and query the points between that date range. There we go. Here, this um, can set the confidence of the fire data. The MODIS fire data has confidence values from 0 to 100. Typically, um, less than 30 is low, very low confidence. So if you want to filter low confidence out the low confidence information, you can filter by confidence. Or if you want 
very high confidence, usually, you know, six, above 60, definitely above 80 is very high confidence. So these points here show both MODIS and VIRUS data. MODIS has a fire information uh, twice a day going back to the 2000. It's coarser resolution, so it's about one kilometer. The VIRS data is a more recent, about 2014. And you can see there's many more VIRS points that are detected. That's because it's about 375 meter resolution. So with that higher resolution, you pick up smaller fires and more fires within an area. If you zoom into the map, you can click on the point and you can see the latitude, longitude, the date, the time, the relative confidence. So here it says 57% confidence. The satellite, which is the detected on the Terra satellite, and the general brightness, and the fire rate of power. The fire rate of power can be a useful number to tell you how hot the fire is burning, so how much biomass is being burned. Uh, this may indicate if the fire is burning in a forest um, versus an agricultural area. Here's the VIRUS fire data. It's a different satellite sensor. It has similar information, but the confidence information is a bit different. Um, usually say nominal, which is like okay. Um, and this is the N SWAMI MPP satellite. And this has a fire, fire rate of potential of five. This map has some tools like measuring bef between distances of the fire and perhaps where you are, just a little measurement tool. You can also print the screen if you're interested in that image. You can change the units, meters, miles. And the great thing about this is you can also download the data that you see in that view. So it's a subset of the data. And you can down it, download the data as a shapefile, a KML, a CSV if you just want a text file or something you can use in an Excel document. You can also download the PNG or the JPEG. So if I choose shapefile, I can download that information. And I can save it to my computer, and it comes as a zip file. Okay. So next I'm going to show you how you can create an uh, alert within your area of interest. Uh, first, to create alert, you do need a login, so we can send you the email alert. And when you're using the system, there are option, in, uh, language options, English, French, Spanish, and Bahasa. All of the, um, all of the text in the, in the website and the emails are translated by native speakers of that language. So if you log in, you can go to Manage My Profile, and that just has general information about you. So here is my profile, and if I want to view my subscriptions, I can see the subscriptions that I already have. If I want to create a new subscription, I can choose this alert system. If you want to know if we'll get higher resolution active fire alerts, you can choose VIRS, and then the country of interest interested in the particular department and choose that department. You can also choose if you want to receive an alert in a forest area, forest cover, or vegetation cover, you can choose the vegetation type, like uh, human mountain forest. You can choose the frequency of alert delivery, so daily or weekly reports, or you can choose near real time, where 
our server every 30 minutes checks for updates on active fires and we'll send alerts out as soon as we receive them. Here you can choose the language of choice, the base map for their for an image, and then the attachments can be a text file with just geographic information of the, the fire detection, a KML, or a shapefile. And then you can just add the name of your alert, and then you create a subscription, and you can leave it, and you don't have to log back in unless you want to change your subscriptions. And then you should be receiving email alerts when fires happen in your area of interest. All right, um, that's our demonstration of Firecast. And we've made it. We've just completed the final session of our seminar series. In this session, we introduced you to near real-time monitoring alert systems. We discussed how the systems are being used, and we gave some examples of prominent systems such as Firecast, Gold Forest Watch, Glad Alerts, and Map. We also reviewed three very useful mobile applications for alert detection and data collection, Forest Watcher, APHIS, and Survey123. I am going to now let Jenny um, talk about, to summarize the course. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So in summary, in this three session webinar series in support of Earth Observations for Indigenous Led man Land Management, we have, in session one, reviewed satellite data and mapping tools available to inform sustainable land management decisions. We've covered a range of topics, including maps, GPS, GIS, participatory GIS, participatory mapping, as well as creating a map in Google Earth. In session two, we reviewed a range of remote sensing concepts and discussed a range of satellite sensors and image interpretation techniques relevant to sustainable land management. Specifically, we captured the principles of remote sensing with satellites and drones. We discussed spectral signatures, as well as resolutions, including spatial and temporal considerations. We covered satellite sensors, data portals, software, and provided a demonstration of the Esri Landsat Explorer app. And today, in session three, we reviewed a range of systems and mobile apps for near real-time monitoring and early warning alerts. Specifically, we captured a range of web-based tools for a variety of applications and skill levels and presented mobile apps for GIS and participatory mapping. Finally, Karen just provided a demonstration of Firecast. Throughout this series, we have emphasized freely available options and readily usable platforms and apps that provide easily accessible data with utility for informing a range of sustainable land management decisions. Thank you, and I would like to now open up the webinar for a question and answer session. Thank you for your questions so far. I'm going to read some of the questions and answer them as they come in. So um, first question is, is it possible to download a free near real-time data for a specific region? Um, yes, it's possible. It depends on uh, what type of near real-time data you want to download. Um, NASA's uh, LANT system, which we will provide a link to um, following the session, provides near real-time information on most MODIS, um, VIRS data. And this is all available 
usually within three to five hours after the satellite overpass. Um, if you go to this, it's a FTP site, I believe, uh, you can download the data if you know, um, you know, where the geographic coordinates of what you're interested, you can download a specific, um, what a tile for that area. Also, as we had demonstrated, um, if it's active fire, there is a bunch of applications that allow you to download the fire for a, a very specific um, area of interest, whether it's fire cast with protected areas or administrative units. Um, and there's also firms allows you to download a particular area of interest, GFW fires and APHIS. Um, some of them allow for if you want to upload a custom shapefile, um, you can get a just data within that custom area. So, um, so there are many ways to get the information depending on what neural time data you're interested in. Okay, so next question. Um, are there any geo app um, stories available in the context of early warning alert systems? So um, I guess my answer to this would be a, um, I'm, I'm familiar with story maps is a way of telling story about certain applications. And Firecast has a story map. We could also share the link with you. And if you do go to Esri Story Maps, there's, you can search the gallery and there's some thematic story maps or story map groups where if you look for early warning systems or conservation, you can, they link a bunch of um, story maps about different tools or different conservation applications. All right, next question. Do you think one can successfully apply remote sensing for indigenous-led land management in African countries, considering the high level of wildlife killings in this continent? So I believe there are ways to apply remote sensing and particularly to help tackle illegal wildlife poaching. Um, I am familiar with some applications where remote sensing is used um, to monitor and predict the greening up um, during the wet season to predict wildlife migrations. So the knowing where migration, migrating species are and uh, when they're going to be at a location can really help strategize patrolling um, to help protect the animals. Um, I know that there are other institutions who do a lot more work in this area, one being the Jane Goodall Institute. Um, and uh, I can follow up after this webinar with um, more examples of what that institute is doing and what others may be doing and how they are applying remote sensing for wildlife, um, illegal wildlife um, poaching. Karen, I would also add to that uh, one of the applications that we showed was Wildlife Insights, which uses remote camera trapping data in order to monitor um, animal movement, animal tracking, etc. And there are certainly uh, applications for that in terms of um, indigenous led land management as well. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, um, another question. The, are, the fire ca are the fires in fire casts, um, are they uh, detected in urban areas as well? And yes, uh, the fires are detected in urban areas. Um, of course, sometimes in urban areas you have really hot areas like smokestacks, um, but these are actually filtered out of the data sets, so you shouldn't see uh, hot air, like a hot point because of a smokestack. Uh, the, what happens is um, through the data processing, if there's an area that's consistently hot, it's actually ignored um, and is, is not considered a fire. So that's one way of kind of quality control of the data. Um, and uh, fire casts in particular are areas of interest are mostly related to forests and vegetation types. If the vegetation map for that um, country has an urban class, then you can filter through urban class. Um, but uh, but yes, it is definitely possible to see the fires in and around urban areas. Um, next question, so APHIS. Um, is it predicting fire spread or is it observation? So APHIS has 
uh, active fire detections um, globally. It also has fire danger, um, uh, which is global as well. So that is just saying where it is extremely dry, drier than normal, and where there could be potential for ignition and spreading. Um, also, there is a predictive fire spread model. Um, I'm not sure if it's global, I'd have to check. It may just be in South Africa or Southern Africa where it is, um, where the model runs, but um, I can definitely check with APHIS and see, uh, learn more about their fire prediction model. But you can also check the website out too. I'm pretty sure they do have that model, at least for Southern Africa. All right, next question. Is there an application like Firecast in the Mediterranean area? Um, yes, there is. There is, out of the JRC, uh, I think, I forgot what it's, like, Jen, you can help me. I think it's the Joint Research, uh, what's C stand for? Yeah, the Joint Research Center in Italy. There we go, <laughs> in Italy. Um, they also have a uh, fire alert warning system that is is regional, um, especially for Europe, although I believe it also um, hosts global data sets as well. All right, next question. Being that internet is a large limitation in remote areas like the Amazon, how do you handle it to still use the apps? There is other ways to raise alerts like phones or radio communications? Are there other ways to raise alerts like phones and radio communications? So that's a good question. Obviously, internet is a huge challenge in many places where we work. The apps that we showed you today, some of them, not sure if all of them, but most of them, for the most, they work offline. So you do have to be online at some point to maybe download information onto your application, but then you can go offline and not have cellular access or internet. And it will, you can still use the GPS. It, can, it will still use the satellite GPS um, and track where you are going in the app. You can download, uh, you know, take a photo. It will record your GPS coordinate, even though you're offline. So that's called offline capability. So if you're looking for an application and that's uh, something you're interested in, that uh, um, you need to have offline capability. So look for that um, out on an app. And then you can bring it back to an internet, a place with an internet to either upload that data on a website or, or somewhere else. As far as um, communicating through phones and radio, that's definitely used a lot, and um, most of that is coordinated at the local level. Communities will coordinate um, through radio or phones, um, particularly in, if they see a fire, um, they will maybe radio it into the local fire brigade. Um, so there, there is a lot of local coordination that can happen. Uh, the apps that are providing the satellite data, for the most part, um, they, you know, what they need is that community level, that local level of communication and coordination to help make those information from those apps useful. Thanks, Karen. I would also um, add to that two examples that we recently experienced in, in Ecuador, one at the provincial government level and one at the local community level. And um, as Karen highlighted, they were using both radios and phones quite extensively at the provincial level. They obviously had internet, but then they had a really effective um, radio system in order to provide the alert information out to uh, firefighters in the field. So as Karen mentioned, at, at some uh, level, there does need to be um, internet accessibility at least for the, the real-time download, but, but many of the apps, as well as this example in Ecuador, were making use of either offline capabilities or phones or radios to get the information distributed into the field. Great, thanks Jenny. 
Great. Next question. Are any of the applications you've demonstrated in need of volunteer skilled application developers? Um, I'm not sure for particular applications. I think there's a lot of opportunities with applications, specifically in-country applications, national level applications, um, that uh, just building these applications um, would definitely require some skilled developers. But I, I can't tell you off the top of my head um, which one. All right. Number nine, as some indigenous communities, especially in Asia, are practicing shifting cultivate, cultivation, is it rather problematic that these apps focus so much on fire alerts? They burn parts of the forest for cultivation, cultivation in a sustainable manner, leaving it fallow for many years after use. Since they are criminalized for practicing this cultivation method, is it possible to use remote sensing for documenting that the shifting cultivation is in fact sustainable over time, rather than governments and rangers using them to criminalize indigenous communities? So this is a good question. I'm not um, particularly, uh, I'm not certain about the applications in Asia for practicing shifting cultiva cultivation. I know that um, many of the applications for the fire, uh, active fire, and also fire danger is not particularly for um, criminalizing, but it's intended to be an additional information to help prevent uncontrolled burning. And in, in the many of the communities that we work, um, the interest is that, of course, you know, the fire shower culture is very much part of the practices, but there's also acknowledgement that when fires go out of control, that damages infrastructure, that damages the forest. So, um, so there's definitely this acknowledgement of, you know, we're still going to use fire shower culture and for average practices, but we want to be able to control it better. We want to know when we shouldn't be burning because it's going to spread when we don't want it to, and that has implications for the community. So um, I think there's a real, um, I think focusing on the information as a way to, you know, en you know en enhance practices, not get rid of them, but just um, make the practices even more sustainable um, and so that they don't damage other ecosystems or the infrastructure. That's the key for many of these applications. I would also add to that, Karen, that um, if it were possible to use, there are a number of remote sensing products that will show greenness, increasing greenness, and so, so some kind of balance between um, the active fire products, for example, but then this repeated increase in greenness could be used to potentially show, show sustainable land management practices. Um, so I think there could be some opportunities there. Great, thanks. Okay, next question. Is there a platform to unify all geodata generated with different tools? Um, I would say there's no single platform. There are many initiatives to kind of tie a bunch of data sets together. Um, one particular from UNDP. Um, you know, Global Forest Watch is a, another um, platform trying to tie in a lot of data sets. There's, as uh, we had mentioned, I guess in the first session, we, we kind of introduced the ESRI mapping application. That was an application part of this Amerigeos platform. And that is another platform under the group of Earth Observations intended as a pulling together a lot of different data sets, tools, and platforms, and a bunch of different data types. Um, we could send um, these links to some of these platforms. I, you know, of course, I don't think a single platform is going to pull up everything, but um, there are ongoing initiatives trying to complement the, all of the tools that are out there. Okay, in the past experiences, how did you transfer knowledge to indigenous people? How did you train them? 
was it a challenge to empower people? So that's a good question. Um, I think on our team, we have people who especially are um, our tech, our uh, leads in Ecuador and Peru have a lot more experience in engage, engaging the different indigenous groups. And I think the, at least in, in um, talking with them and, and the experience that we've had working with the groups, it's just a lot, it's a long-term engagement and it's just a lot of listening. And um, I find that it's, you know, often I'm, learning a lot more than I go in to do, do training. It's, it's, it's actually, I'm getting, a, I'm learning a lot from it as well. So I don't think that there's a simple answer to this question, um, but I would say just long-term engagement and just listening more than teaching is probably key to, um, to at least understanding and, and empowerment. I would absolutely agree with that, Karen. Um, and and I would say it really is. It's kind of this transfer both ways. Um, it's it's learning from indigenous communities regarding how they're currently addressing their their land management issues, and then and then working with them to think about what tools exist that could further enhance their practices. Um, so again, for me, it's this transfer of, of knowledge in, in both directions. Um, and then as Karen mentioned, uh, prolonged engagement, I think, um, is really the key. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, um, next question. Is there any work that you have done using GOES 16 or 17 for fire detection? Um, I haven't personally worked with GOES 16 or 17, but I, know that there are some of the systems we mentioned, um, APHIS, for example, um, also include GOES um, active fire products. I do know that there's currently a fire product coming out that's going to be a geostationary fire product. It's going to use, it's a global product that's going to use detections from multiple GOES satellites to look at, get a continuous view of fire detections around the world. So that's something that's in development and hopefully coming out in the next year or two. And I can um, also provide a link to the journal article about that and maybe if I find the website <laughs> regarding that data. Uh, question 13, are you aware of any mobile applications that can help monitor human rights violations? Um, I am not. However, I can ask some of our, team, our um, people at CI who kind of work more in, in, the, in that field and see if they are aware of any apps and we can get back to you on that. How much is, is drought responsible for the fires and forests and why isn't there wasn't early warning alerts in the recent California alert um, in the California fires to alert locals. So um, drought does play a huge role in in the ignition potential ignition of fires. Um, very basically, that's one of the biggest determinants is the, of the drought and how severe the drought is. Um, and so, of course, the other component of that is the ignition source. So in areas where, um, in, the, in the US particularly, lightning is a huge source of ignition, but then of course, of course there's a lot of anthropogenic sources of emission, cigarettes, um, campfires, um, which overwhelmingly um, are the ignition source for many of the fires. So there are early warning alerts in, um, in, in the U.S. There's very sophisticated models in the U.S. Um, and there definitely were alerts to local fire, um, the fire, uh, what should I say, controls in the region. There's a very sophisticated system of how the U.S. allocates resources um, and, and it's really based on a lot of where the, they predict the fires are going to happen. 
I don't know. I'd not very, I mean, obviously I'm on the East Coast and uh, not directly familiar with the fires and how the alerts go out to the actual communities in the California. So I am not aware of, you know, why the alerts weren't, why, the, why we were not prepared as we should have been. I, I think it's certainly something that we, we have a number of colleagues um, who we could follow up with on that. Uh, as Karen mentioned, there, there are certainly sophisticated early warning systems in the US. My understanding of the, the latest fires in, in California, um, they moved particularly quickly. And I think weather, especially the wind, was a significant factor in that. Um, but we could certainly um, get some more specificity on the actual uh, systems, etc. Would you know um, what organizations are doing similar work like yours, but applied to air quality and pollution? Um, so I know that the World Resources Institute with their Global Forest Watch platform are doing alerts on air quality and pollution. Um, I know that in Indonesia, there are government platforms that also have early warning for air quality and pollution. Um, I'm not off the top of my head, I don't know of others, but there's air quality definitely can be monitored in near real time by satellites. So um, we can look up some other systems that might be available. If you have a particular geographic area of interest, you can follow up with us, let us know um, by, with the specifics of that question, and we can try to figure out if there's a system that monitors near real-time air quality in your area of interest. Okay, great. Um, I don't see other questions coming in. Um, so thank you so much for your interest and, and for all of your interesting questions today. Um, what we couldn't answer, we will follow up later. So we'll make sure to get back to, to everyone and make sure to look for that information as it's posted. Thank you again for staying a little bit later in the session, um, our final session, and we've really enjoyed uh, have hosting these webinars, and I hope that you've enjoyed it too. Um, we will be, you will be receiving an email from RSET on a survey, and we really appreciate your feedback on, on how how useful this information was, how it could be improved, and um, also we're interested in, in how you plan on applying some of the information you learned. So thank you again. And thank you from me. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.